It's a great honor for me to be here at the Empire Club of Canada today, which is arguably the most famous and historically relevant speakers podium to have ever existed in Canada. It has offered its podium to such international luminaries as Winston Churchill, Ronald Reagan, Audrey Hepburn, the Dalai Lama, Indira Gandhi, and closer to home from Pierre Trudeau to Justin Trudeau. Literally generations of our great nation's leaders alongside with those of the world's top international diplomats, heads of state, and business and thought leaders. It is a real honor and a distinct privilege to be invited to speak to the Empire Club of Canada, which has been welcoming international diplomats, leaders in business and in science and in politics when they stand at that podium. They speak not only to the entire country, but they can speak to the entire world. Good afternoon, fellow directors, past presidents, members, and guests. Welcome to the 118th season of the Empire Club of Canada. My name is Kelly Jackson. I'm the president of the board of directors of the Empire Club of Canada and vice president, external affairs and professional learning at Humber College. I am your host for today's event, focused on how Toronto's waterfront can reach its full potential. Today, we will hear about the plans to build new communities with improved transit, affordable housing, and access to green space all in this key part of one of North America's largest cities. I'd like to begin this afternoon with an acknowledgement. I am hosting this event within the traditional and treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit and the homelands of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wyandotte peoples. In acknowledging traditional territories, I do so from a place of understanding the privilege my ancestors and I have had in this country since they first arrived here in the 1830s. As farmers in southwestern Ontario, I imagine they felt a deep connection to the land and yet likely did not recognize how that connection was built on the displacement of others. Delivering a land acknowledgement for me, it's always an important opportunity to reflect on our human connection and responsibility to care for the land and to recognize that to do so, we must always respect each other and acknowledge our histories. We encourage everyone tuning in today to learn more about the traditional territory on which you work and live. The Empire Club of Canada is a nonprofit organization. So I now wanna take a minute to recognize our sponsors who generously support the club and make these events possible and complimentary for our supporters to attend. Thank you to our lead event sponsor, the Waterfront BIA. Thank you also to our season sponsors, the Canadian Bankers Association, Leuna, Waste Connections of Canada, and Bruce Power. Before we get into today's conversation, just a few housekeeping notes. I want to remind everybody who is participating today that this is an interactive event. So if you're attending live, please, I encourage you to engage by taking advantage of the question box you can find below your on-screen video player. We have reserved some time for audience questions towards the end of the discussion. We also invite you to share your thoughts on social media using the hashtags displayed on screen throughout the event. And if you require technical assistance, please start a conversation with our team using the chat button on the right-hand side of your screen. To those watching on demand later and to those tuning in on the podcast, welcome. It's now my pleasure to call this virtual meeting to order. I am delighted to welcome our guest speakers today to the Empire Club of Canada's virtual stage for the first time. Deputy Mayor Anna Bailao, who is the Chair of the Planning and Housing Committee for Toronto and Councillor for Ward 9 in the City of Toronto. Dr. Gervin Ferron, who is President of George Brown College. George Zagarek, who is President and CEO of Waterfront Toronto and our moderator today who is Miriam Adaya, journalist at CBC Radio Canada. You can learn more about our speakers today by scrolling down your screen, and there you will find their full bios on the page below the video player. I'd like to now hand it over to Miriam to get the discussion started. Miriam, a big welcome and over to you. 
Thank you so much, Kelly. Good afternoon, bon après-midi. My name is Mir Medaya. I am pleased to be here with you today. I'm a bilingual journalist based in Toronto, and I myself have lived on the waterfront for a few years, so I have some great friends there as well. Je m'appelle Miriam Medaya. Je suis journaliste multiplateforme basée à Toronto. J'ai moi-même habité dans le quartier waterfront à Toronto et je garde de très bons souvenirs. I keep great memories from the waterfront. I'm very excited to also learn more about the waterfront together. Let's start and jump right into it with George. Let's start with you. How has the waterfront evolved over the last 20 years? Thanks, Miriam. And as I said before, we're hoping to get you back to the waterfront. So hopefully uh, this presentation will interest you. Um, so our mandate 20 years ago was to uh, focus on revitalizing the waterfront creating homes, creating affordable housing homes, uh, creating uh, opportunities to advance our environmental agenda, whether it's flood protection or leads uh, buildings. We also created open space. Um, and I think to be frank, the mandate is as relevant, if not more relevant today than it was 20 years ago. The same issues, whether we talk about affordable housing, uh, you know, during the pandemic, housing became a big issue. During the pandemic, we heard about uh, having more uh, green space to be able to access. Uh, we have built uh, a number of uh, units, both uh, affordable and just private units, uh, 3,800 and then uh, about 600 uh, affordable housing units. We'll be more than doubling that. I'll, I'll be speaking to that in a few minutes. Um, we had 15 Leeds buildings. We had, um, you know, 42, 43 hectares of park space. Those issues are still the issues of today. So I would say that they're probably just become more urgent. Um, and the ability of governments to deal with these uh, individually is almost impossible. So the fact that we were set up as a three government agency um, I think is more relevant because the issues are so complex, no one level of government can deal with it. So if I go just quickly to a few slides, um, if we can go to the first slide. If you look back to uh, where we were back in 2006, um, you know, we had a little bit of skyscraper uh, area, but uh, quite, quite a bit of space that still needed to be developed and also um, contaminated soil need to be addressed because we couldn't build until we cleaned it up. Um, we also needed to build, uh, you know, some uh, flood protection to be able to build out the West Onlands and the Pan Am Village. Um, I'm just looking if we can go to the second slide, 2015. I don't know if they're showing up, but I hope they're there. Um, you can see the development. We have a lot more skyscrapers. We have a lot more green space being built. One of the key priorities that we heard from the public is to make sure we continue to have access to the waterfront. If we go to the next slide, um, you know, you look at what this looked like back then. Um, we had, you know, contaminated uh, soils. We had wa industrial wastelands. Uh, we needed to actually address that by advancing the development, but cleaning it up and really making this a complete community. So if you go to the next slide, you can see we've actually, you know, built beautiful promenades. Uh, we built uh, the Corkdown Common, which is both a park, but it's also a flood protection zone. Um, and then you look at, you know, again, uh, building out more public space was really important. So I think, you know, we've evolved in terms of, uh, you know, we've advanced things over the last 20 years, um, but I think the mandate is, equally relevant and probably even more important today. And Dr. Ferran, George Brown College was one of the first institutions to take a big bet on the future of the waterfront and set up shop there. What potential did the establishment see in that part of town? Uh, thank you for that question. And, and I, I think in many respects, uh, what we saw as the potential uh, was the opportunity to really contribute to the growth and future of Toronto. And that growth and future very much uh, lies within the waterfront. I, I think as we 
have seen over the last uh, 20 years or so an incredible growth uh, and development in the waterfront. As a result, uh, George Brown wanted to be a part of, of that future of Toronto. And in some respects, it, it was a bet not only on the waterfront, it was a bet on Toronto. And I think it was the right decision and, and we've grown and, and been a part of, of that growth since 2012. And, and it's been an amazing development since that period. Deputy Mayor Bailao, how can the eastern part of the waterfront become a lively neighborhood, right, and an area that is still very much industrialized? Well, um, I think that we're uh, we're off to a good start. As uh, George said, uh, we have communities that are already being built. We are attracting leading education institutions like we have here today. We are attracting business. So there's a reputation that the waterfront is a place where business want to be, where people want to be. So I think it is imperative that we continue to invest in the infrastructure. I think that uh, what, uh, what led this was three levels of government believing in this revitalization, investing in it, and so attracting the development, the quality of development and uh, the quality of businesses and innovation that we see now in the waterfront. So that's what we need to continue is with good planning, focusing on our principles being you know re reconciliation affordable housing uh now that you know we need to build back our economy how we, we have here so much potential to to bring innovation and to bring businesses in here so all this with good planning and an investment in infrastructure will be essential to unlock more than 700 acres and in a fast growing opportunity uh, city like ours i say this is the big opportunity of our city George, tell us what are some uh, of the current projects underway at the waterfront that you're also looking to develop in the next years? Yeah, if we can show the next slide, um, you'll see really three priorities that we've uh, identified. Keyside, which we made a, a wonderful announcement last week, which Dream and Great Gulf will be advancing with their partners with internationally recognized um, architects, um, more than doubling our affordable housing in the area, creating about 40% of the space fully dedicated to public space. Um, so that's exciting. Parliament Slip, which we're, uh, we announced uh, a number of months ago with regards to the opportunity to actually develop the water area so that uh, we would have the opportunity, like Chicago and some other areas, where we could have a restaurant uh, on an extended pier, we would have uh, bridges there. We'd have transit going uh, to and from, not just to the island, but along the shores so that you could actually use it as a public transit system. Um, it would have two great swimming pools that could be used all year long. It'll have retail spaces. Uh, it, it'll be just a place to activate all year long, which is one of the things that we looked at. We need to have people come down on the waterfront 12 months a year. Now, the other piece that we're working on with CREATIO in the city is uh, the island that we're building through the flood protection, which is called Villiers uh, Island. And that will be another spectacular piece of property for development. Um, and it, it's an opportunity for us to further advance our environmental goals, making it just as we did for Keyside, one of the first uh, carbon zero uh, communities and, and advancing it with a lot more affordable housing, probably over a thousand units there. Um, so we've got lots on our plate, very exciting. And I think, uh, you know, as we proved with the number of proposals we got, uh, Toronto, everybody recognizes Toronto is a place to be. And I, I think we just want to raise the level of expectation of what we can do on the waterfront. Thank you, George. And as you know, in Toronto, finding affordable housing can be challenging, especially downtown. Deputy Mayor Bailao, what is being done on the waterfront to build more affordable housing for Torontonians? Well, I think that uh, the city of Toronto had a policy shift at the beginning of this uh, term that was very significant. Um, some people might have not noticed, but we took a big shift from dealing with our lands, which we had our real estate company built Toronto that was very much on a transactional base. We would sell a lot of land and get the money to a city building. So we, we now have uh, CREATIO that develops 
land uh, to city building initiatives and a lot of it affordable housing. So the city is the major land owner in the port lands in a lot of this land. So working with the other orders of government with Waterfront Toronto, I think we have a great opportunity here to use the value that is created through flood protections, through uh, unlocking this, these lands and getting some of that value to be used for the creation of affordable housing in complete communities. And important is as well to make sure that we're leveraging the affordable housing programs that all levels of government have available. If we do that, if we continue to work together on the waterfront towards our goals, and every government continues to say that housing affordability, affordable housing is a major key deliverable for all of them. And I think they say that because people are saying that. People are saying that during elections and people are saying that every day. They recognize that this is a great opportunity. So if we leverage each other programs, if we use the land value, and ultimately if we have partners that are going to develop those lands that believe in city building. And I think we've been uh, picking our partners well. They come with proposals. They know that we value that. But they, they, what we've been seeing is they're responding to our calls to have more affordable housing, to have excellent design, to have excellent public spaces. And that is important. We need the partners in there and we need the governments in there and use the, the maximum uh, uh, value that we can take from that land. And do you have an idea of how many affordable housing units can Torontonians expect on the waterfront in the years to come? So we, the city uh, has committed to 20%. We are, our plan uh, currently uh, says 20%. I know that we're trying to attain more. We're trying to get more. Uh, we are currently uh, reviewing uh, the plan because the plan was done a few years ago. And so actually city planning is having consultations. Actually, let me plug it in. There's another one tonight. And so for people that want to make sure they participate uh, in, in the visioning of uh, of how this uh, this is this co these communities are going to be planned. We're doing those consultations, and and uh, we we definitely want to do as much as possible. But there's a commitment on the table about twenty percent. But you know the density that we're going to have is going to be important. The kind of planning that we're going to have is going to be important. The value that we get from the land is going to be important. Um, you know we we can't forget the the transit. It is really important that. When we talk about infrastructure right now, we've been focusing on the infrastructure that, you know, that George showed on his slides, you know, the flood protection and the waters and the sewers. We need to now start thinking about the transit that we're going to need. And as we develop these communities, the public open spaces, the recreational spaces, these have to be done hand in hand. It can't be an afterthought. It, had to, it has to be good planning. And that's why the work that we're doing now to um, and consult to work with our communities to create this plan is extremely important. And with that, you know, planning is is the first part. The second part is also the the commitment with funding from all three orders of government. We can go much much farther if we have three levels of government continue to invest and to believe in the waterfront. Thank you. And let's go to Dr. Farron. Let's talk about innovation and keep talking about growing the waterfront. How is the waterfront campus built for the future? Uh, thank you for that question. And I, I think that a really good way to think of it is how we started. When we started off in about 2012, we only had about 2,000 uh, individuals, students and employees here at the waterfront. Today, we're already at 8,000. Uh, we are have grown uh, in terms of, of our footprint here with uh, more than uh, almost uh, 650,000 square feet um, in terms of footprint. We're building uh, a new uh, location here at the waterfront, uh, Limberloss Place, that will add uh, 175,000 uh, square feet. And all of this um, build out is because we really think that it's important to have educational institutions like George Brown contribute not only to uh, city building and community building, um, but also um, have a sense of, of the idea that uh, the waterfront can be a place where people live, where people play, but also where they, they learn and grow. And in that context, um, what we've been doing at the waterfront already in terms of our, our programming, in terms of design, in terms of technology, in health, are, are all uh, areas that are part of the future skills and uh, talent base 
of Toronto. And consequently, we feel that the work that we're doing at the, at the waterfront will really contribute to the skilled space and attracting and retaining talent in Toronto. And that makes it a, a really vibrant place for investment and for retention of capital and, and economic growth and prosperity. So in that respect, I think that when I think about the future of George Brown College at the waterfront is, is adding to the prosperity of Toronto. And as well as to recognize that with what we're doing at the waterfront is not only for the waterfront, but really relates to people right across Toronto and across Ontario, um, meaning that it's a major attraction for the city. And as we think about our needs in terms of um, adding to that growth that we've already had as a post-secondary educational institution at the waterfront, we're paralleling and championing the ideas of the city in terms of the need for transportation. Our students also need affordable housing. We currently have about 500 residents um, and in the general catch of the waterfront. We're hoping to build that out into the future as well. Culinary arts, what we do with culinary arts, being able to add to the kind of um, restaurant and, and retail outlets that are here in, in with our partners as well. Um, but broadly speaking, to make uh, George Brown uh, the campus that we have here become a vibrant part of the general community. So that means that individuals who live in the community can come and access our facilities and engage with our facilities. And that means that we're making that contribution to all to Torontonians and in fact to Ontario as well. Thank you for your answer. And George, how do we connect these people, right? How do we connect the waterfront to the rest of the city? And how important is it that we build transit early in the development of the East End? Sorry, I muted myself. Um, it's very important. So, you know, connecting, um, as I talked about the Eastern waterfront uh, to the rest of the downtown core, it's extremely important. Uh, we built out transit uh, on the west side of the waterfront. Uh, we now need to do that on the east side of the waterfront. There is no uh, reason to build out affordable housing, uh, job uh, employment opportunities if people can't get there. Uh, so we need to build that early. And the, and the benefit is if we announce it early, actually the three levels of government, will benefit from the fact that uh, we'll get a higher price for the land when it's announced. So that's an important part. We've also, uh, you will have seen three of our four bridges that have come down to Villiers Island. They're spectacular. They're an important, important part of connecting the island to the rest uh, of the city. And I think one of the other things that I'll just mention, um, building not just on the LRT discussion, but how, how do we connect people to the waterfront you know, we, we are also looking at not what we're creating, but what, how we're creating it. And if you would have saw in the Keysight announcement, 20% of all of the construction hours are going to Indigenous and other equity deserving groups. Um, and we're also creating jobs for them at the end of the day. We have our first MOU with Massages of the Credit. So I think, you know, part of this is making sure everybody is part of the solution at the waterfront as well. Deputy Mayor Bailao, the City of Toronto plans to build an extension of the waterfront light rail transit east through Portlands. That plan is not funded yet. Can you tell us how involved is the city in this project? The city has been very involved. I mean, the city has been working with Waterfront Toronto, with the TTC on, on getting uh, the, the, all the waterfront transit plan uh, underway. Um, like you said, it's not funded. Um, I don't know how many times I've already mentioned three levels of government need to be at the table. Um, so I will keep saying that at every answer that I give um, because uh, uh, the reality is that these are the kinds of projects that we need the three levels of the government. Um, um, because, you know, let, let's, let's be honest. I mean, at the end of the day, this is an opportunity for the city, but, you know, Toronto is... Uh, the economic engine of, of the country. And if for us to continue to attract investments and the jobs uh, and the talent, uh, it is imperative that we all do these investments. And, and the governments that receive all the income taxes, all the sales taxes, all, everything is actually the provincial and federal government. So, you know, um, we still have a, a system uh, that uh, the, uh, the city of Toronto has very limited revenue tools. And so we, it is imperative that, uh, that we have this, um, 
this coordinated approach to take the uh, the most um, and to um, uh, deliver on our goals. Because I think the governments are very aligned on all, all the goals. And as George said, it makes perfect sense that we announce this funding you know, sooner rather than later, because we're all going to benefit from that. The land is going to be, you know, um, uh, uh, worth more. The market, the people will see that the governments are committed to it. So the quality of proposals, the partners that will come to the table uh, will be significantly different. And that's that's what, what's made the difference is that the, the market, the business, the academic institutions, they've seen the commitment from all three orders of government. We need to continue to have that in order for uh, for us to go out and to have the same kind of partnerships that we've been having to this point. And to go back to Dr. Ferran, can you tell us how will George Brown College expand in the waterfront in the next few years and what can students and members of the community expect? Sure. So, uh, in, in fact, we have a few slides that can really demonstrate this. Uh, our most recent uh, announcement is Limberlaw's Place, and we're really pleased as well that we've had major partners um, that's been a part of, of, of these uh, developments um, as well. So I'd like to really thank uh, Jack Cockwell for his recent um, donation to uh, the College of, of $10 million that, that's going towards uh, Limberlaw's Place. Now, uh, what's material about uh, Limberlaw's Place? It's a mass timber uh, facility, one of the largest ones for institutional use in Canada. The technology um, being used in the building uh, means that we'll have have uh, zero uh, uh, net uh, emissions as well. We'll be integrating into the uh, waterfront um, cooling system and heating system that goes right across the entire uh, waterfront to um, N-Wave as well, which makes it a really efficient building. We have uh, some new technologies, if you go to the next slide as well, uh, that we'll be using in, in terms of, of what's called a solar chimney. And uh, the idea, if you take a look at the slope of, of that roofing system, that allows us to have airflow assist in, in cooling the building. And uh, what it does is provide uh, the waterfront uh, with a showcase of what can be done in terms of environmental responsibility, in terms of sustainability, in terms of mass timber. Uh, so as a result, when we think about this building that will be available to our students and to our researchers, we'll also have uh, the Brookfield Sustainability Institute within that, that building. Uh, what we're hoping to do is to not only have this as a teaching and learning center, but to attract individuals from around the world uh, to the waterfront to take a look at what can be done with mass timber, what can be done in terms of sustainability, and how post-secondary educational institutions can be very much a part of um, city growth and city building and community building. So uh, the work that we're doing not only contributes to our students, it also contributes to showcasing uh, Canadian technology um, and uh, showcasing it here right at the waterfront in Toronto. Um, of course, uh, one of the key items uh, for us, if you go to the next slide, uh, is uh, ultimately the people. And part of that, what that means then, is that we very much champion the, the work that's being done by the city as well as um, by Waterfront Toronto in terms of transportation needs. And we too would say the earlier we get those announcements and commitments, uh, the better it is for the kind of development that we're hoping to uh, contribute here at the Waterfront. We're already, as mentioned, at, at about 8,000 um, um, people uh, at the waterfront um, most days uh, coming down, um, uh, adjusting for COVID, of course, uh, we're almost 800,000 square feet, uh, but that is a tip of the potential uh, that we can do and others can do in partnership at the waterfront with the right transportation, the right network uh, in, the, in the region as well. Thank you so much. And last question before we go to the questions of the audience, because there are many. George, is there a waterfront you've been inspired by and would like Toronto to learn from, to emulate? Uh, one, one of the things we did is actually look at kind of the top 10 waterfronts across the world to say what brought them up to the top 10. And what we learned is you can't get by on six or seven attributes. You need a, a number of cluster of activities just as um, Gervin said, you know, we have the Innovation Center, we have George Brown, uh, Mars is coming down, UT. Um, 
it's important to have a cluster of activities, cultural activities, um, as you know, everybody thinks of the Sydney Opera House, but there are many cultural uh, uh, signature projects on the waterfronts. So that's what the board looked at. And um, if we can put the slide up of the four signature projects that are on our five-year plan, uh, we need to upgrade Jack Layton Ferry Terminal that was built for a time uh, with far fewer people using the terminal and needs to be upgraded. We're working with the city and they're having discussions with future developers around that. We look at a signature uh, cultural piece. Uh, it's probably not gonna be the Sydney Opera House, but it has to be something that can activate. And we have a, a, a great number of cultural um, strengths in our community, both in terms of the entertainment, the film industry, others. Um, digital is a big part of the sector that we're dealing with. Um, we continue to want to make sure that we could connect our walkways all the way around the waterfront. You will see whether you're in Rio de Janeiro or Sydney, you can actually walk the entire perimeter of the waterfront and it's easily accessible. Um, so these are, you know, important and destination playground, which uh, is a big part of what we want to build on Villiers Island. Uh, it is an opportunity to bring families down to the waterfront to be active, uh, especially during the challenges that we had during the pandemic. We need places for people to go out with their families or even with their pets to get out. Um, the Destination Playground is one of the fundraising projects along with the other three. Uh, Art Trail is another project that we have, but the Destination Playground is pretty spectacular. We hope to be able to fundraise over the next little while uh, to make this a reality. Tulsa, Oklahoma has one, um, and Chicago, Maggie Daly Park has one, but the Tulsa one, people are driving eight hours to come and visit that. So they far exceeded uh, the, the expected demand. I think that this is a huge opportunity. So I, you know, I think we've learned a lot by looking at other jurisdictions and trying to create a Toronto-centric solution uh, to activating the waterfront. Thank you so much, George. And let's dive into the questions from the public. I have a few here. First, Angelo asks, the Eastern waterfront needs the LRT to reach full potential. The many folks that live, work, and learn on the Eastern waterfront need commuting connections now. Can we expedite the LRT construction for ones to enter? Well, maybe I can jump in and then uh, if the deputy mayor wants to jump in, but as she said already, uh, we, we are working with the TTC in the city uh, around the 30% design. We're trying to advance uh, to the 60% uh, after that. And we are actively lobbying um, for funding from all three levels of government, obviously. Uh, there's no way the city can do this on its own. And if we're trying to attract jobs that the federal and provincial government uh, and the city government have talked about, we already know headquarters have talked to us, they wanna come down on the waterfront, but they're not coming down uh, if their employees can't get there. So I think these are important things that we need to look at uh, in addition to servicing obviously all the uh, affordable housing and private housing that we're gonna create. But uh, I, th I think it absolutely is a priority. It's one of the two priorities for the city and it's a priority for our board. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll echo that, Miriam, is, is that it is definitely a priority for the city and, and the city has it in every conversation with the, the other orders of government. And I, I would just add that, um, you know, when we talk about the uh, waterfront and I mentioned, you know, Toronto is the economic engine of, of Toronto, but the waterfront, this whole revitalization is a project of national significance and provincial significance. Um, I was talking to George the other day and he was saying that the bridges that we have were actually built in our Atlantic provinces. You know, the transit that we'll have, they'll be manufactured in other provinces and other parts of the province. Uh, you know, these are creating jobs and economic growth, not only in our city. What we're doing in the waterfront has a ripple effect actually across the nation and across the province. And so we're, uh, we're going to continue to to invest as well and to put as, as uh, much resources um, as possible. Uh, we, do, we have created the City Building Fund, which is a fund that the city has to invest in transit as well. Um, and, and this is definitely the top priority that we have identified in the city. Thank you so much. 
And another question from an anonymous person this time. Um, how do you see Ontario Place fitting into these plans and also the future of Ontario Place, as you know? You want me to jump in or, uh, you know what, I'll, I'll jump in initially. You know what, we work with the province very carefully. Um, Ontario Place is a uh, provincial project, um, but I am constantly in contact with the uh, CEO for Infrastructure Ontario and with the province. And we've always offered any assistance we can uh, give in that project, we're available, but uh, that's a provincial project, but we try to plan together. Uh, they sit on our intergovernmental steering committee on all of our projects and they look at how do our activities actually integrate in with their plans as well. And I think these are projects that need to complement each other, right? You can't be planning one side of the waterfront in isolation of what is happening somewhere else. They need to complement each other as we're planning for open spaces, for recreational spaces, for business to come to the waterfront, for Toronto to turn its face to the waterfront. Because I, I think that for, for a few decades, uh, Toronto had its back to the waterfront. And I think finally we're turning... Uh, uh, um, you know, face first and embracing the waterfront. And people want to do that. I think we need to take all these projects in consideration to make sure they complement each other. Something that's coming up a lot in the audience's question is, how do we keep the waterfront affordable, but also safe, diverse and accessible? Can anyone uh, give us some thoughts? Uh, maybe I'll, I'll make some reflections on that. I, I think one of the items that as a post-secondary educational institution that's at the waterfront, uh, our student base, our employee base, uh, very, very diverse. I, I really applaud um, the considerations that's been given uh, to Indigenous peoples and, and to the initiatives uh, that are, are envisioned uh, forward in, in that sense. So I think in terms of the, the kind of uh, partners and participants that are here at the waterfront can play a really important part. I, uh, the next consideration in terms of uh, affordability, in terms of housing, um, is a, and making sure that that's accessible. Uh, transportation network that, that brings family and, and individuals right across uh, Toronto and Canada uh, to be able to access uh, the waterfront is a, another important one. But I also think in terms of uh, the, the kind of partnerships that we build at the waterfront and the kind of uh, employment opportunities and investment opportunities and talent building opportunities uh, that we play an important role in making sure that we're building uh, a diverse economy to the, the kind of educational uh, opportunities and training programs that we do in making sure that we're inclusive in that, that context. So I think that there's a, a significant part that can be played with all partners. And here at George Brown, I, I think that we're a significant partner in making sure that we're, we're that part of, of both city building and community building in, in that context as well. Thank Maybe you. I'll just add, if I can, yes, just quickly, um, you know, I think Gervin hit the point on Partnerships are a big part of our success in the past and will be in the future. And we probably consult with the public more than any other agency. Um, so the public will have a voice. So when we talked about, and I always talk about, I'd like to activate the waterfront um, 12 months a year and as long as you know we can throughout the day, but also recognizing people live here and need to be able to sleep at night and you know are worried about noise and other um, obstacles to that, uh, uh, to that vision. And, you know, we have to listen and we have to compromise and find solutions. And uh, I think we've done a very good job at that in the past and we will in the future. Question from Brian who asks, um, I find there is some disconnect between the developer's vision, which means local and somewhat short-sighted in his opinion, and the planning of the integrated community needs, such as schools, parklands, et cetera. Any thoughts on whether or not there's a disconnect between the developer's vision and what the city or what partners are trying to do on a community basis? Might I start in with just a quick reflection? I, I think as we take a look at even going back to the 1990s and um, Place to Grow 
um, act by way of example and some of the planning initiatives that that's been taken and, and a lot of this information is available to the city site or waterfront site. Um, I think the incredible balance that's been placed between uh, space and affordability and accessibility that, that the planning efforts have, have really provided a foundation for how um, uh, participants such as ourselves but others um, interact and, and really try to meet the public's need uh, in terms of how we develop in, in that regard. So I think I, I appreciate the question, but I also think that there, this has been uh, what a showcase of city planning and community planning that's been done at the waterfront uh, that I think is a showcase to the world. But um, similar to what was said by, by George and, and as, as well as by the deputy mayor, um, that, that it's important for communities and for the public to keep pushing um, all the participants at the waterfront to live up to the expectations uh, that they have for a, a bright and prosperous um, engaged future. Uh, for us all. So I, I think the question is perfectly placed, um, but I also think it's such an incredible showcase of what partnership can, can bring towards uh, city development and community development. Mary, I'm going to put in a quick commercial here. Um, we have a, uh, a video that uh, I believe the Empire Club will uh, circulate the link at the end, and it's a video of a recently announced project at Keyside uh, that has our developers and their uh, great talent speaking to the vision that they have, which is very, very tightly aligned with what we had put out. So I don't think there's a lot of space, certainly on this recent project. And I would uh, strongly suggest after, you know, people have uh, listened to us throughout this last hour uh, that they go to that video link. And I think they'll be surprised at how exciting and aligned they are. If I could add, I think that uh, we've actually seen significant progression from both from government's involvement. I mean, we have the West Don lands, which was provincial uh, land that the province came through to develop a complete community in there with significant number of affordable housing. Uh, we have we've had different involvements throughout, you know, these uh, this last decade where we've, we've seen development. Um, and I think George is absolutely right. I think what we've seen in this latest proposal uh, in terms of um, environmental standards, in terms of innovation in the in the construction and real estate, which is going to be key uh, for the affordability as well and to set the tone uh, to the industry actually uh, across the, the country as well, to uh, the public realm, I think that uh, that uh, there's been significantly a significant improvement, and I think that it is a result of the interest that that uh, city have uh, the the citizens of the city have have shown on on the waterfront. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Going back to George, uh, you mentioned something about indigenous communities and how this would also benefit them. Um, someone asked, a member of the audience asked, I'd like to learn more about the economic opportunities that this development will provide to the First Nations treaty holders of this territory. Can you enlighten us? Yeah, so uh, the proposal, uh, as we identified, has made commitments uh, both to the indigenous and to other equity deserving groups, uh, both in terms of job opportunities one of the things that we identified early on in the RFP is whoever the uh, successful proponent uh, for us to negotiate with would have to uh, commit a certain number of hours, um, create the opportunity to create new uh, businesses, Indigenous-led businesses, Indigenous-led employment opportunities. Um, and this proponent actually exceeded those commitments. Uh, we are very shortly, uh, going to sit around the table with the Miss Sagas of the credit. Um, I've already had discussions with uh, Stacey LaForme, the chief, and, and with uh, Dream and Great Gulf. Um, very exciting opportunities, both in terms of some of the cultural centers, uh, the job opportunities. Um, and I just, you know, there's a, a level of trust that I see that has been built. These developers, fortunately, are local. Uh, so we are more uh, focused on their past reputation as well. And I think they, you know, they've demonstrated and we'll wait and see as we develop a final project agreement on the details, but uh, they certainly have put forward some very strong commitments. 
Miriam, I, I think this is important to, because, you know, probably 20 years ago, we, we would talk about these projects and the benefits that at the end of the project they would bring to the communities or the community. What we're doing now and what, what uh, we're seeing in several projects across the city and the province is this idea to bring community benefits agreements so that from day one, there's actually communities that are taking uh, a benefit as well of the projects so that we are training people that might not have access to certain opportunities, that we're giving them careers, that we're giving them jobs, that we're giving them the affordable housing so that it's not only at the end of the project, actually, that we're going to be right. making sure that there's equity, but it's actually right from the beginning. And I think this is an important component of what Waterfront has done with this with this deal um, that is really exciting as well as it goes uh, in in um, in what we're working with reconciliation, with creating opportunities in BIPOC communities and equity deserving communities um, from day one. And I think that is um, it's important to mention that that aspect as well. We have another question when it comes to transit, when it comes to building the waterfront. This is from Chris, who asks, transit will help build the value of the land at the waterfront. What priority is given to active transportation, such as walking and biking across the waterfront? Well, maybe I'll, I'll just point out, we have built uh, kilometers of new bike lanes and walkable space along the waterfront. That continues to be our priority. Um, active, uh, active mobility, um, and that includes not just uh, being able to move uh, in a non-transit way, but uh, you know, accessibility is an important part of our mobility uh, opportunities. So we have a an access, accessibility um, advisory panel that talks about how do we make sure people with disabilities or you know individuals who are in wheelchairs, individuals who are blind um, have the opportunity to use that space safely too. So it's not just creating bike lanes and walkable spaces, but it's to make sure that we make it safe and accessible for all. And the connectivity to the city, Miriam. I think we have great opportunity not only to ensure that our cycling network map starts to include that, that part of the city, but for example, we have great uh, rail path systems and trail systems that can be connected and should be connected. I mean, I represent the West End. We have the West Toronto Rail Path and connecting that to the waterfront trail to make sure that it goes all the way there. When we think about connectivity and mobility, we think we need to think about all those modes of transportation, walking, cycling, and, and uh, transit, absolutely. And, and with the cycling, it's not only the road network, but even actually the, the entire connectivity to the site through the trail system that we have. Perhaps a question for Dr. Ferran. When it comes to, there's a lot of questions from the audience about how to make sure the Eastern part of the waterfront is livable, family friendly. How do we make sure Torontonians and their families are comfortable moving to the Eastern part of town and feeling at home? Um, I, I think one of the key items that we've made an emphasis on is the idea of community building. Uh, I, I think that is important in terms of development, in terms of the, the actual buildings and facilities that are there, but how do you build community? And uh, that's a part that we were playing a role in, um, an example of that we've um, played a role in having a number of, of COVID um, uh, vaccine clinics uh, here in support of the community, um, being able to engage uh, with different uh, community organizations and, and being a part of the vibrancy of, of making it a place to live uh, in, in terms of the quality of life. So I think that's a role that we can play. And I think that's that's also a role uh, that, that community members can interact with us um, at George Brown because we're, we're such a uh, significant um, part of, of the waterfront in, in that context. Um, but I think there are also a number of points that, that were made mentioned before relating to transportation and, and the likes. Uh, but one of the, the key items is, as well is, is citizen involvement and engagement. There's this right outside one of our buildings here at the waterfront, there's a skating rink. Um, by way of example, and uh, that sense of community of people getting out and skating and riding and walking and um, just being a part of community, I think, is, is a really important part of um, individuals viewing it as their community, uh, not simply a place to sleep, um, but a place to live, grow and enjoy. 
If I can just add, uh, since you mentioned families, one of the things I should have uh, pointed out is the recent announcement over 800 units that we're building on Keyside. Um, over 60% of those units are going to be two plus, three plus, four plus bedroom units. Uh, because that's a huge gap that we have seen. And I'm sure the deputy mayor would speak to that kind of missing uh, family uh, units, rentable units that the city has been confronted with and we're hoping to be part of that solution. Yeah, if, I, if, I may, if I may supplement on one item as well, um, as part of our, our new building, we're also looking at daycare facilities as well. So um, those are the kinds of things that, that we're looking at to make sure that we're supporting families um, uh, across the area as well. Yeah, Miriam, absolutely. Family size units and the, the infrastructure, the daycares, the schools, the parks, it's essential. It's as, as we plan a complete community, we do need to focus on those, uh, uh, those issues as well. Deputy Mayor, perhaps a question for you. Um, about the LRT and Portlands, can you talk about what the next steps would be into getting it funded? Um, advocacy, advocacy, uh, making sure that uh, that we have it uh, included in our uh, ten-year capital budget as well. Um, so there's uh, uh, there's uh, conversations that are happening. Um, as uh, at the political level, at uh, different organizations such as Waterfront Toronto, I think we all continue to to advocate. But it's uh, those two items that uh, that on on the city level need to continue. It's, it's to obtain the commitment from the the province and the and and the federal government, and to ensure that uh, we also have it in our capital budget. And it's almost time to wrap up. So before we go, I would like to hear from all of you on this. What are some of the things that will be needed going for it to truly reach the waterfront's full potential? Well, I'm gonna start off with the last comment, which is we, we need that announcement of transit. Um, transit is a big equalizer when it comes to inequity. Um, so the sooner we can advance that, uh, the rest of the plans and quite frankly, the precinct plans uh, for the Portlands all assume that we would have transit. So the whole thing falls apart without advancing the transit discussion. If I may go ahead, as, as next, I would um, say transit as well, um, but I also say community involvement and, and engagement. We're here and our doors are open and look forward to partnering with um, members of the community, as well as the new partners that are coming to uh, the waterfront as well. I would say three things. Guess what the first one is? <laughs> the three governments at the table and the money and the commitment, absolutely. The, uh, uh, to advance our infrastructure and, and the, the, the LRT is the first priority, but there's, as we build these communities, there are other, commu other issues in terms of infrastructure, both social infrastructure and hard physical infrastructure that are very much needed. And to continue to be laser focused on our principles, on our principles of reconciliation, of inclusion, of excellence in, in a creation of public spaces and architecture and uh, innovation. And I think that that is really important that we continue laser focus on these goals. Thank you so much. Thank you to our guests and their generosity. Thank you also to the members of the audience for your many, many questions. I apologize, I couldn't get through them all, but I hope we answered some of your questions. Thank you again, Kelly, over to you. Thank you, Miriam. And thank you to all our panelists for joining us today. I'd now like to introduce Tim Coker, Executive Director of the Waterfront BIA to deliver some appreciation remarks. Tim, welcome. Thank you, Kelly, and thank you to all the Empire Club staff for organizing today's event, and also to Kitsunet Rang, who got the conversation started us on this event. Um, may the next event on the future of the waterfront actually be on the waterfront and in person. I'll keep my fingers crossed. Thank you for Miriam for moderating, and to Deputy Mayor Balao, Dr. Fran, and George for taking the time today. I think at the waterfront, BIA as a relatively small organization among many, many waterfront stakeholders, we're always well aware that if we want to reach the world-class potential for the waterfront that we all dream of for the future. It means a lot of organizations and people have to work together and they have to work together constructively. So with civic leaders like George Brown College renewing their commitment here, public leaders like Deputy Mayor Balao 
advocating to maximize the waterfront's potential. And with Waterfront Toronto continuing to refine how they coordinate and work with not just all three levels of government, but with our world-class development community, sounds like we're right on track. Um, last, I'd like to thank all of those who made time to tune in today. I'd also like to get the subliminal message into your head to please visit the waterfront again soon, not just to support our businesses, of course, but also to walk on the water and try to get out on the water in a new way this year, please. And if you're not already, please follow Waterfront VI on social media. That's where we'll tell you what's happening every week. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Tim. And thanks again to the Waterfront BIA and our season sponsors for their support. Thank you as well to our guests and everybody who joined us today and those who will be watching this later on demand. Our next virtual event will take place on February 28th at 12 noon Eastern time. Join me for a conversation with the Honorable Karina Gould, Minister of Families, Children and Social Development. We'll be talking about the importance of a Canada-wide early learning and child care system and what that means for families and our economy. Then on March 8th, join us as we celebrate International Women's Day with a stellar panel, including the women behind Biggest Tech IPO of 2021, the acquisition of one of Canada's most innovative exchanges, and the strategic transformation of Canada's largest specialty toy and bookstore. All amazing leaders will be in conversation with the Globe and Mail's Rita Trisher. More details and complimentary registration for both events are available at empireclubofcanada.com. This meeting is now adjourned. I wish you a great afternoon. Take care and stay safe.